All right, folks, let's begin. Uh, we're going to continue our series of talk lectures on uh, generative models for uh, training neural networks which can model distributions. So what we have covered so far are these topics. We've looked at VAEs, we've looked at flow models, and we've looked at diffusion models. Does anybody have any questions about the top those topics? Any questions? Anyone? No? Okay. So this week, we're going to be talking about generative adversarial networks, GANs, which are yet another form of generative model. But what is unique about GANs is not the model itself, it's the manner in which they're trained. So for a quick recap, here is the problem again. We want to train a neural network to, to learn the task of generation. So we want to be able to present it with a large collection of data from of a specific kind. For example, a, a large collection of images of faces or a large body of text relating maybe stories, whatever. And from this collection of data, it must learn the distribution of this type of data. Subsequently, you must be able to sample from this distribution and generate novel samples. So for example, you want to be able to learn the distribution of faces or face images from all of these pictures. And later that network should be able to generate a completely novel uh, face, something that it has never seen before and perhaps does not exist in the world. So the question here was, how do we even characterize this distribution? So here, uh, before we continue, I want to point out that there are two distinctive kinds of models, uh, uses for neural networks. So what we are looking at over here is, is uh, uh, generative models. And when you and in general, when you're speaking of machine learning models, they're all statistical models. They fall into one of two categories. They can either be discriminative or they can be generative. Discriminative models learn to discriminate between classes. In effect, they learn the posterior probability distribution of a class given data, or it could even be a continuous valued variable. Uh, so y over here, a discriminative, discriminative model learns a p of y given x. y could be a continuous valued variable, if you're, for example, if you're performing regression. And if you're performing classification, this could be a categorical variable. So we have already learned that standard MLPs are discriminative models. They learn the posterior probabilities of the classes, or they learn to compute the posterior probabilities of classes given data. Generative models, on the other hand, learn the, they learn the distribution itself. So again, of they, they learn the joint distribution of the class and the data. So here in the discriminative model, the model learns the behavior of the conditional distribution of the class given the data. In the case of the generative model, it learns the joint distribution of the class and the data. When stated like this, Perhaps the distinction is not very clear, but then from a more uh, practical point of view, what do the discriminative models learn? They learn the decision boundaries between classes. They learn the nature of the boundary such that anything that's on one side of the boundary can be attributed to one class and any data that lies on the other side can, can be attributed to the other and it learns the boundary itself. Whereas a generative model, learns the actual probability distribution of data. Uh, do you recall any, uh, the slides should have been posted. Are they not posted? Uh, so please check the answer. I sent the slides out yesterday. If they're not, my apologies, they'll be up immediately after class, right? Uh, no, because this is on Zoom and I know exactly who attends. So anyway, uh, now, we have spoken of some kinds of generative, uh, generative models, and uh, can anybody remind me of any examples? 
examples of generative models that we've learned? Anyone? Even before all of that, even before all of that, when I spoke of, when we were speaking of, did you actually look at the first VAE lecture? There are two, there are a few different generative models that I mentioned. Can anybody, PCA, Naives? You didn't really see the lecture, did you? Gaussian? There were others, Gaussian mixtures. I mentioned some other, something else, right? And does anybody remember anything else? I think you guys should go back and look at the lecture because it is important, right? The EM algorithm is about learning the model but the generative model. So what was the theory? What is the story we stated behind the generative model itself? Why did we call it a generative model? Anyone? Okay. Let's get on with it. But basically, generative models actually learn the probability distribution of data. I mentioned category distributions, multinomials, right? We spoke of mixture multinomials. We spoke of learning Gaussians, Gaussian mixtures. And of course, we learned about VAEs. We learned about PCA. There was a little bit about factor analysis. And all of these are generative models. But at the bottom, every one of these learns the actual probability distribution of data. On the other hand, discriminative models only learn the boundary between classes. So discriminative models have very limited scope of use. They can only be used for classification or maybe simple prediction because they're, they're learning the boundary between classes. So they can tell you, you know, which category a given data instance belongs to, or it can predict the, the uh, categorical or the, the dependent variable y given the data x, and that's about it, right? So logistic regression, SVMs, your simple MLPs, all of these can only perform classification or simple prediction. Generative models, on the other hand, can be used for performing discriminative tasks. So if you actually learn the actual distribution of the data, then you can use those to actually determine, compute the posterior probability of classes, and from that, get the, uh, the decision boundaries between classes. And so if, you, if you've gone through any machine learning uh, course, you almost certainly encountered naive Bayes uh, classification with Gaussian, with Gaussian distributions, Gaussian mixture models, et cetera. All of these are generative models where we use them for classification, for a discriminative task. On the other hand, the generative models come with the added benefit that you can actually use these to sample from the distribution, to generate data from the distribution. So when I'm speaking of generating data from the distribution, then yeah, it turns out we actually run up into a yet another complication, uh, which we will encounter uh, shortly, which we will see on the next slide. Uh, the first, of course, is that you need to be able to learn this joint distribution model, right? So, uh, and because we need to be able to learn this joint distribution model, it requires a deeper understanding of the distribution than the discriminative model. In the case of the discriminative model, you only need to know what the boundary looks like. For a generative model, you need to know what all of the data look like. That's one. And second, even in that case, it turns out that generative models over here can, because they require a deeper understanding of the distribution, they can come in two, two, two varieties. They can be explicit. In an explicit distribution model, if I give you the, the, mod, the model learns to compute probabilities. So once the model is learned, if I give you some data X and I ask you, what is the probability of this data instance X? It will be able to give you that number. For example, if I'm learning a Gaussian, then uh, once I've learned the parameters of the Gaussian, I can give you any X and I can ask you the probability of that X, you plug it into the formula for the Gaussian, and you will get 
the actual probability for x. But then generative models can also be implicit. Implicit models are incapable of computing the probability of any given x. On the other hand, without actually being able to compute the probability of, of data instances, they can still generate samples from the distribution P of x. So for explicit distributions, of course, I've given you the example, Gaussians. Have we encountered implicit distribution models before? Anyone? Have we encountered implicit distributions? Does anybody remember? Language model. Yeah, more recently in the in class. Anyone? Diffusion. VAEs, diffusion, you know, basically uh, VAEs. Can, can you use a VAE to compute the probability of a data instance? Can you? Yes or no? I'd like to see the answer. Here's a poll. Can I use a variational autoencoder to compute the probability of a specific data instance? Anyone? No. Okay. How would you use it? How how would you compute the probability of a data instance? Anybody want to guess? You, you cannot, right? A VAE. What what is the what is the premise of a VAE? The generative component of the VAE is the decoder, right? And how does the decoder operate? You sample the seed distribution, typically a Gaussian, and you pass it through the uh, decoder, and it converts the sample to a sample from your target class, like a face, right? But it's a forward process. You're sampling from the Gaussian, and you're passing it through. If I give you a face, there's no way for you to come back and say, this is the probability of this face. So VAE is a implicit distribution model. We have already encountered this. And can you, uh, can anybody give me examples of explicit distributions that we've encountered? Anyone? I just mentioned it. Guys, come on, I know it's 8 a.m., but I'd like to see some answers. Multimodal naive base. Is there a second person who can answer me that? Some A Gaussian, right? A multinomial is an explicit distribution. I can give you an observation, you will compute a probability for it. A Gaussian, I can give you a variable, an observation, you can compute a probability for it. Quentin, in a normalizing flow, you can't really compute the probability of an observation, right? It's a, it's a VAE. Anyways, so here's your first poll. Uh, and let me pull this up. This is on. The polls on Zoom. Can you not see the poll? poll? This is odd. Well, I can see. see. Okay. Any chance you can see it now? Yeah, good now. Yeah. 
Okay, 10 seconds, guys. Okay, I'll stop it. And here are the results. Okay, for the first question, what is the difference between generative and discriminative models? What is the answer? Your B. Second Can anyone one. answer me? A, this right? Yeah. The discriminative, discriminative models model the decision boundary between classes. Generative models model class distributions. What about the second question? B. B, right? So, okay, so here we are. This is the answer. Discriminative models model the decision boundary between classes and generative models model class distributions. And explicit models compute the probability of samples, whereas implicit models only let you draw samples from the distribution, right? So we see the distinctions. Now let's get back to our problem, right? Here was our problem. We have a large collection of images, of, of data, say images of faces, and we want a network to learn to generate new samples from this class. For example, a new portrait, right? What kind of distribution would this be? What kind of model would this be? Would this be discriminative or generative? Anyone? Generative, right? I can't hear you. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Would, I'm back. I, uh, would we require an explicit model or an implicit model for this? An implicit should be sufficient, right? Yeah. We just need to be able to, able to generate. So that's what we're going to have. This is what we saw in a VAE, right? And here's what the decoder of a VAE looked like. So in the decoder of a VAE, we, we drew a sample Z from some seed distribution, typically a Gaussian. And this was passed through a, a some nonlinear transform, which was the decoder. I'm calling this the generator, which transforms Z so that you got some generated data outside. And this X hat was supposed to have a distribution that was similar to your training data X. And so now, of course, this is a parametric model, right? Meaning this network here has parameters theta. And in our VAE model, what came out was we also added some uncorrelated noise to, to whatever came out. Now, why did we add uncorrelated noise to the VAE output? If anybody has seen the second VA lecture, even at 4x, you'll have an answer for that. So why did we add that? Anyone? Do we able to backpropagate the parameterization trick? No, anybody else? Folks, you're supposed to watch those things when I ask you to watch things, right? 
because obviously there's content there that is meaningful. So the way we defined it, we said that this generator over here, the assumption was that the distribution itself lies on some curved manifold. And so this generator over here folded this lower dimensional Z onto the curved manifold. And the uh, uh, noise E modeled the uncorrelated variations of the manifold. And so we actually posited an equivalence between uh, factor analysis and, and VAEs. In factor analysis, this was a linear transform. In VAEs, this was a nonlinear transform. So uh, to account for the fact that you actually are just modeling the surface on which the distribution lies, or the, or the principal surface on which the distribution lies, we allowed Z to be a lower dimensional variable. And to account for the rest of the variable variation, we added some uncorrelated noise. And so this was our entire generator model. And this output X over here, if the model was properly learned, was supposed to be uh, suppo supposed to have a distribution which was the same as the distribution of your of the training data. Now this is of course a parametric model because this generator function has parameters theta, right? And so because this is a generative model, we train this using the maximum likelihood principle. Does anybody remember the maximum likelihood principle? If you watched my first VAE lecture, I gave it a name, right? What was that? In the very beginning. What was the idea there? Anyone? That was the maximum likelihood principle. What was it? Why did we arrive at the maximum likelihood principle? We said the world was a very boring place, right? And so the idea behind the maximum likelihood principle was that the data that you saw was very typical of the underlying process. That's correct, Quentin. And so uh, we wanted to choose the process for which these data were most typical, right? So given a collection of choices, we chose the of distributions. We selected the distribution which had the, for which these data, the data our training data were most typical. That is our training data were most probable. And so that's the, the maximum likelihood principle is the world is a boring place uh, principle, right? And so the model over here itself represents some probability distribution, parametric probability distribution. We had a collection of training data X. And since this is a parametric distribution, we could compute the log probability of our training data. And we optimized the model parameters theta such that this log probability was maximized. So this was the maximum likelihood estimation procedure that we used to train VAEs, right? And I can rewrite this as minimization of the negative log likelihood. Maximization of the log, log likelihood or minimization of the negative log, li log likelihood is the same thing, except now this begins to look like a loss, right? Now, if I were to use this to train a distribution for faces, and I gave you a large collection of faces, what problems could possibly arise? Remember, we are training an implicit model, this uh, an implicit generative model. We want to, want to use it to generate samples, right? So now, if I were to train this model using the maximum likelihood principle, what are the issues that could arise? Anyone? Any ideas? We haven't seen this in the lectures, so you know. Uh, no, so now I'm asking you to hypothesize. No single distribution can model it. Your data set doesn't capture all kinds of data. Yes, right. Uh, yeah. So 
if I were to, the problem is likelihood maximization does not actually relate to whether the act output actually looks like a face, right? Now, remember that what we are doing is training an implicit model, right? I'm giving you a collection of faces. If I'm training a model using the maximum likelihood principle on a collection of training data, then all it has to do is to make sure that the specific instances that you have in your training data have very high likelihood, right? Does this say anything at all about the instances that are not in your training data? Does this say anything about it? So, if I were to randomly sample from this, do you have any explicit assurance that what you get is going to be face-like? No. All you can say is that the likelihood of the training samples is maximized. You make no statement at all about what happens outside of those points, right? So given this, again, we want to, uh, what we really want is to use this model as an implicit generative model. We want to use it to generate new samples. Likelihood maximization is not doing this. Likelihood maximization is merely teaching, making sure that the specific training instances we have have the have very high likelihood. Doesn't say anything about uh, any other samples that you might draw from this distribution, right? But then again, I want this model to be to learn to generate faces, right? So can I make that training criterion more direct? How would I do it? Any ideas? I mean, wouldn't you need something that can tell what a face is? So would you need some kind of classifier for that? So basically you want something like this, right? The loss that you want, again, like, you know, the negative log likelihood is really not, the negative log likelihood of training data does not represent the ability of the model to generate more data of the same kind. So we want a more direct loss. We want a loss which can evaluate samples drawn generated by this model and say, does this look like a face? The DILAF loss, I'm calling it the DILAF loss. Does it look like a face, right? And so this is what we would really like, right? Make sense? Questions? Yes, yes. If no, yeah. Here's a poll. Two. Launch it. Can you see the poll? Okay, guys, five seconds. All right. Okay, let me ask this for the first question, true or false? True, right? 
the Isaiah plus and generative models. For the second question, which of the choices? A, right? The model can maximize the likelihood of training data without any assurance about what other non-training samples would look like, right? What about the third one? Clearly, if you wanted to generate faces, you want the loss to explicitly state whether randomly drawn samples from this model look like a face or not. Make sense? Any questions? Okay. So, what happened here? Right? No. All right, let me continue. Any questions so far? No. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to replace the negative log, log likelihood, which was what the, which was the loss that was used to train the AE or the diffusion model or the uh, normalizing flow, pretty much all of them, with a more relevant loss, which is a does this low does it look like a face loss? the DILAF loss, right? But what would a good DILAF loss be? What kind of loss is going to evaluate if the output actually looks like a face? Anyone? A classifier, right? These are gets. Uh, so when you stick, when you replace this, uh, and so that's where generative adversarial networks come in. A GAN, what's a GAN? Generative adversarial networks, it has three components. There's the generator, which is a generative model, which generate data similar to the training data, like in the variational order encoder. Typically, the generator is an implicit generative model. It could be explicit, but then, you know, for the the most, uh, more often than not, it's going to be implicit because implicit models are a whole lot more flexible. Now, the second term here, adversarial, is a classifier which actually performs this task of determining whether a randomly drawn sample from the, from the uh, generator actually looks like a tar the target class or not. And so, it also, it's typically also a neural network. And so you end up with these two networks, a uh, uh, generator and an adversary that are competing with one another. But basically you have to remember that this adversary is just your DILAF loss, right? And of course, it's all neural networks. So GANs were introduced in 2014 uh, in a landmark paper where uh, the goal was to model the distribution of training data in order to be able to sample, generate samples from PFX using a pair of models as adversaries. A generator, which is the implicit generative model that generates the data. And then instead of having a standard negative log likelihood, the loss itself was based on a model which had to be differentiable for derivatives to prop propagate backwards or DILAF loss, right? Does it look like a face loss? This is a, the discriminator is this loss. It computes the loss, which is very more directly related to the task of generation. And so here's the overall structure. Here's how it's typically drawn. This is the GAN. You have uh, two, two main components, the generator, and the discriminator. Now, the initial portion here, Z coming from P of Z, that's, that's just a seed distribution. It could be anything. It could be a Gaussian. Uh, again, Zs are being sampled from a seed distribution. So in fact, there's nothing stopping this Zs from itself being, this P of Z itself from being, recursively being an implicit uh, generative model, right? So. Uh, this could be a Gaussian, a Laplacian, or a VAE for all you care. And the out samples from the seed distribution are put through a generator, which transforms these samples into some data x hat, 
And these generated samples are evaluated by a discriminator, which determines if these generated samples do indeed look like the class that they're supposed to represent. And how, the, how does this, deter, this discriminator decide that? It also refers to real data from the same class. Now, here, observe that in, the GAN, in your VAE, you are only using generative models. The GAN is cleverly using, also using a discriminative model, except that it's using the discriminative model to provide a loss to train the generator. And so discriminators are easier to train, as we saw, because uh, they only have to learn the decision boundary, right? And a posterior probability. And so the discriminator just learns from real data and these, sam and these generated samples. And uh, the discriminator can tell you, based on this reference real data, real images, whether whatever you have generated is really uh, looking like these things or not. Right? Is it real or fake? It's a laugh loss. So here are the two key components, the generative, the generative component and the discriminative component. Now, what does the generator look like? The generator is just the decoder of your, looks much like the decoder of your VAE. Uh, it's an implicit generative model. And the idea is to produce, uh, is to, transform samples drawn from the seed distribution such that the transformed samples look like instances from your target class. They look like faces, right? And the seed distribution can be any known prior. It basically, it could be a standard Gaussian. You can choose anything that's convenient. Now, uh, now keep in mind that in the process of doing this, what the generator is really doing is actually modeling a distribution, right? So it's transforming P of Z to P of X hat. So rather than P of X hat, I'm going to call this P G of X simply because I want to uh, emphasize that this is the distribution of samples produced by the generator. So the P subscript G sort of emphasizes that, the, that this is the distribution of samples produced by the generator. And so the generator, transforms this distribution to PG of X. If you uh, sampled a very large number, an infinite number of samples from P of Z, put them all through the generator and, uh, and analyze the distribution of the things that came out of the model, that is going to be PG of X. And our objective is that this distribution must be identical or near identical to the distribution, actual distribution of the target class. In our, in our, in our example, this would be faces. And the discriminator over here, on the other hand, is a classifier that is trained to tell the difference between real and generated data. So basically it's, uh, again, the question we wanted to ask is, does this really look like a face? And so the way the, the discrim discriminator answers this question by, uh, by essentially comparing whatever comes out of the generator to real faces and telling you whether it looks like those or not. So it learns to tell the difference between real and generated data. And specifically, uh, the discriminator is optimized to distinguish between the kind of samples that the generator generates and real data. If a perfect discriminator is fooled, then the generated data cannot be distinguished from real data. So uh, here is the overall system. You have a generator and a discriminator. The generator generates sam to samples, it transforms samples from the seed distribution to X hat. So effectively it generates samples X hat. And the discriminator learns to distinguish between the generated samples and real data. Now, you might ask a question, uh, you know, the way I presented it, you might think that it would be sufficient for the discriminator to be a really, really good face classifier, for it to be a classifier that looks at images and says, is this a face or is this not a face? Why would that not be sufficient? Could I use that over here? Anyone? 
Then you have any ideas on why that wouldn't work? Or would it work? It's a different question from real fake. Well, you know, fake is not a face anyway, right? So is it a face versus it's, is it not a face? Is it really a superset of is it real versus is it fake? Is it not? So why could we not use it? Examples, right? So I could have trained, for example, a discriminator on a vast amount of real face data. So why would that not, not work over here? Here's why, right? In principle, if I had a fantastic discriminator, which could always look at a, uh, uh, which could look at any image and tell you if it's a face or not, right? Then possibly I could use it here. But the reality is that whatever the generator is currently generating, the classification boundary between that and real data will keep changing as the generator changes. And so if you want the generator to push these, to make these data look more and more like the real data, you really want the discriminator to be specialized to the task of making the distinctions between these guys and these guys. The discriminator doesn't have to worry about all the other kinds of data that exist in the world because it's really not going to encounter any of those. So uh, the discriminator really has to, in, in the absence of a perfect discriminator, which can just look at anything and say, this is a face versus it's not a face, you really want it to be able to distinguish, make the distinction between what the generator produces and real data. And we'll see in a few minutes why that makes sense, right? So this means we want to train the discriminator, right? You're going to be providing the discriminator with examples of real faces and examples of synthetic faces produced by the generator. And this discriminator is now trained to distinguish between these two guys. The discriminator is just a binary classifier. Is this a real face or is this a face that's been generated by my generator? And so uh, in this case, if I if the discriminator can be thought of as outputting a posterior probability for real faces, then I want the discriminator to be such that it produces a probability, an output of one for real faces, and it produces an output of zero for synthetic faces. In other words, uh, if the input to the discriminator is X, if X is a real face, you want D of X to be one. If X is a synthetic face, you want it to be zero. That is, you want one minus d of x to be equal to one. Is this making sense? Yes, no? Okay. So I want to train the discriminator to perform this, right? So in other words, I wanted to the discriminator is, discriminator is producing a probability. It produces a value between zero and one. So I wanted to maximize D of X for real faces. And I wanted to maximize one minus D of X for synthetic faces. Alternately, I wanted to maximize log of D of X for real faces. And I wanted to maximize log of one minus D of X for synthetic faces. Is this making sense? Yes, no. Okay. All right. And so let's say I've trained the discriminator, right? Now the discriminator, remember, is actually just a loss, right? So whatever the loss of the discriminator, the whatever the discriminator discriminator computes over here is something that you want to push backwards into the generator. And so you want the generator to maximize the discriminator loss. It's trained to fool the discriminator. Basically, if the generator always does a perfect job of generating face-like images, then the discriminator is going to look at the output of the generator and say, this is a real face. In other words, you want the generator to produce data 
g of z such that d of g of z equals 1. The generator must make the discriminator think that what it produced was a real face or in other words, 1 minus d of g of z equals 0. So this is the objective for the generator. This makes sense? Yes, no? Okay. So the next time I'm going to ask you guys to give me a thumbs up, right? So I want the generator to uh, maximize d of g of z or minimize 1 minus d of g of z, right? So here, yeah, the generator must output data such that the discriminator thinks it's a face, right? So the generator ideally must make uh, must be such that d of g of z, so the discriminator, when it looks at the output of the generator, thinks it's a real, real face. So d of g of z equals 1, or alternately, 1 minus d of g of z equals 0. Does that answer your question, Katrina? Okay. And so I want to train the generator to minimize 1 minus d of g of z. So the generator parameters are trained to minimize the log of 1 minus d of g of z. I think there's a, there's a parenthesis missing over here. And so here's the overall setting, right? The discriminator for real data x, it must maximize log of d of x. It's the discriminator gets, if it gets any input x for real data x, it must maximize log of d of x. For synthetic data, it must maximize log of 1 minus d of x. So basically, it must maximize log of 1 minus d of x hat because x hat are all synthetic data. The generator is trying to fool the discriminator. So as we saw over here, it must try to minimize log of 1 of d of x hat. So is this set of conditions making sense? Yes or no? What about the rest of you guys? Okay, guys, I'm just going to go off from here. So give me a thumbs up or something so I can check. All right. And so let me put both of those together, right? This is the GAN formulation. I want, there are two things. Observe that this second term, log of one minus dx hat, occurs both for the generator and the discriminator log of d of x, where x are real data, only occurs for the generator, right? And so if I want the expected value of log of d of x, what I mean by expected value is that if I generate lots of samples of real data and take the average log of d of x, that's, that's the expected value is basically the average of a large amount of training data drawn from the real data distribution. So that is expected value over x of log of d of x. The second term is log of 1 minus d of g of z, which we saw over here, right? d of x hat. And this is computed over a lot of samples obtained by sampling from z. So it's an expected value over z. And so the overall loss function that I can think of, or the overall objective I can think of, I can, uh, I can be specified in this manner. It's the expectation over real data of log of d of x plus the expectation over synthetic data of the log of 1 minus d of g of z. So is the subjective making sense? Yes or no? OK. And so if you go back and look, both of those terms are used by the discriminator, but only the second term is used by the generator, right? And the discriminator is going to try to maximize both of these terms, as we saw over here. The generator is going to try to minimize the second term, as we saw over here. The first term is not influenced by the by G, so this doesn't really affect the generator. And so the overall GAN formulation is for the discriminator to maximize the X, the uh, expected value of log of d of x, where the expectation is over real data, plus the expected value of log of 1 minus d of x hat, 
where this expectation is over synthetic data, whereas the generator is trying to minimize the same term. And so uh, basically the objective of D over here is it's trying to make D of X one for real data and uh, zero for synthetic data. The generator is trying to make D of X one for synthetic data. So is this, is this uh, framing making sense? Yes or no? Perfect, right? And so the way you would do it is, again, you can't just tra train the discriminator just once. Why can I not just train the discriminator once and be done with it? Anybody? Can I just train the discriminator, discriminator once and freeze it? The generator is changing, right? So each time, we, because the generator changes, the decision boundaries keep changing. And so you have to train the discriminator and then the generator, okay. Now, and so uh, here is the overall process. You're going to iteratively have to train the discriminator to catch up with the generator and the generator to catch up with the discriminator. Once the model is trained, you no longer need the discriminator. You can throw it away because you're really interested in the generation generator, right? So here's your third poll. Let me post it over here. Okay, since I'm short of time, I'm gonna stop in five seconds, guys. All right, let me end the poll. Okay, for the first question, which one do you think is true? You must train the discriminator first, right? For the second one, which is true? Perfect. Also, uh, why do you think the discriminator must be updated more frequently than the generator? Anyone? Because it computes the loss. The discriminator is at DLAF loss, right? Does it look like a face loss? And so that if you don't have a good loss, you can't train anything. Training the loss is very important because it guides the training. So which is why you start with training the loss and then you have to make sure that the loss is always good enough. So you update the discriminator much more frequently than the generator. Now let's see how the whole thing behaves when it's optimized, right? Let's begin by looking at the discriminator. Let's say that the discriminator, at any step the discriminator has become optimal. You have tuned it to the current uh, generated data and the uh, real data. Now, in that case, let's take a look at how things behave. Now, the perfect discriminator is performing a binary classification problem. So you have only two classes and you have to choose between one of the two. So let's consider a generic binary classification problem. This red curve shows the distribution of one class. The blue curve shows the distribution of the other class. It's the joint distribution of the observations and the, and the label. What this means is that uh, the heights have been adjusted for the relative frequencies of the two classes. Now, if you look over here, if I saw a particular observation X, then the probability of this observation having come from the red class is the height of this red line, right? That's going to be P of X comma Y1. The probability of this observation having come from the blue class is the this height which is P of X comma Y2. And so the probability of getting this observation at all is the height of the red line plus the height of the blue line, right? Because it either came from the red class or it came from the blue class. And so this denominator term over here is going to be the probability of 
the observation x. Does that make sense? Over here. Okay, so you're going to initialize your uh, your uh, generator initially, Katrina. So, the, okay, the, is this denominator term making sense over here? To you guys, this is just PFX, right? And the numerator, so if I ask you, if I gave you a specific instance X, and I said, asked you, what, what is the probability that this X came from the red class? That's going to be the height of this red line divided by the sum of the heights of the red and the blue lines, right? That makes sense? Yes or no? Guys. I see like five yeses. What about the rest of you? Okay. So I'm going to take this for a given, right? This is the posterior probability. So the posterior probability of any class is going to be the probability of that class, joint probability of X and that class divided by the sum of the probabilities of both classes for that X, right? And so now, if I got any particular class, which class would you assign it to? Would you assign it to the class that is more probable a posterior, uh, a posteriori, or are you going to assign it to the class that's less probable? Which class would you assign it to? Anyone? You're going to assign it to the more probable class, right? So now let's see. Where is the posterior probability of both classes going to be the same? Can anyone tell me? The intersection, right? Because here the both heights are the same. So each of these terms is going to be the same. So this value is going to be 0.5, right? And so if I plot the posterior probability of, say, the blue class, it's going to go like this. Far out here, there are no data from the blue class. It's all red. And so the posterior probability of zero is blue is going to be small till the blue data begin to show up. And then the posterior probability will become 0.5 where the two distributions exactly intersect. And then after that, the posterior, eventually you see no more red data and the posterior probability of the class is going to become one. And the optimal, the perfect decision boundary where anything on one side is called blue and everything on the other side is called, is called red is going is where the two probability distributions intersect, right? And so if you use the rule which, which says that uh, anything to the right is going to be assigned to blue, anything to the left is going to be assigned to red, you're going to assign X naturally to the class with a higher posterior probability. And so now if we go to our discriminator, our discriminator is actually distinguishing between two classes, synthetic data and real data, right? And the posterior probability that it's going to be computing for any class is simply or the posterior probability. Again, the, the discriminator wants to compute the probability of real faces, right? So the optimal discriminator is going to compute the posterior probability of real faces. It's going to say, uh, which is, the probability of any given X computed using the real data distribution divided by the sum of PFPX of X plus PG of X. It's actually going to be computing this, uh, this posterior probability. That is your optimal classifier. So this making sense? Okay. And specifically, you're going to be taking the decision of whether it's real or not based on when this posterior probability becomes 0.5. So how does this, so let's assume that the discriminator has actually learning this decision boundary. If it's perfectly trained, 
then it's learned to compute the posterior probability and it knows where the posterior probability is 0.5. So it knows the location of this decision boundary, right? So how does the generator behave once if, if it's optimized once the discriminator has been trained? Here's what happens. Let's say this was your in the red curve shows the initial this the, the current distribution of samples produced by the generator. The blue curve shows the distribution of real faces, right? And so the discriminator has learned this black line as the decision boundary between real faces and, and uh, synthetic faces. And it's going to call everything to the right real and everything to the left fake. And that's optimal. It cannot do better, right? Now, if the generator wants to fool this discriminator, what must it do? It must push the distribution so that the distribution goes past so so that the you know the distribution of the synthetic faces the place where it actually intersects the real face distribution goes past the black line so that the classifier begins to make mistakes so the generator is now going to push the distribution towards the real distribution by trying to maximize this error right is this making sense Right. And then what will the okay, so once the generator has done that, what will the discriminator do? At this point. Anyone? What would the discriminator do? If you update the discriminator. So this is where we are, right? In the kth iteration. This is the distribution of synthetic faces produced by the generator. This is a, the blue, of course, is fixed. It will never change. It's the distribution of real faces. And the discriminator has learned this boundary. Then in the k plus 1 iteration, the generator has updated its distribution to slide it past the decision boundary so that the discriminator begins to make errors, right? At which point, the discriminator is now going to update itself and it's going to shift its decision boundary to the new location where the two distributions intersect. Then what will the generator do? Anyone? What would the generator do now if you train it? The generator is going to shift again, right? And so this they're going to be playing this cat and mouse game. When will it stop? When will it stop? When they overlap perfectly, right? When the two distributions overlap, when the generator's distribution sits perfectly on the real distribution, <laughs> then even the optimal discriminator really cannot make out where the two are intersecting because they're intersecting everywhere, right? And so uh, there's going to just produce random outputs. And so this is the how the whole system, how the training is going to evolve. Now, in this case, again, going back, the optimal discriminator is still going to be a Bayesian classifier, right? is going to compute the a posteriori probabilities of the classes in this manner. And now, when I solve for the generator, the generator is actually, again, minimizing this loss, right? Which is the expectation over x of the log of d of x plus expectation over z of log of 1 minus d of x hat, which I've written as d of z. But then, if I write down the actual uh, if the discriminator is actually perfect at this point, if it's uh, actually computing the posterior probability, then with a perfect discriminator, here's my loss, right? That's this term, or my objective rather than my loss, which is the expectation over x of log of dfx plus expectation over generated data of log of 1 minus dfx, right? Let me stick in the formula for dfx right here. And so this is, if when my generator is perfect, the discriminator is going to be, when my discriminator is perfect, 
this is the objective that the generator is going to be trying to minimize. You know, try to. Is this making sense? Yes or no? What about the rest of you? Is it making sense? Questions? Hmm. I see very few yeses. Maybe I, I, can, I can use a few more. And if you if I don't have yeses, maybe you haven't got it. So where did I miss you? Okay. All right. So now let me try to explain what this is, right? And for this, we're going to go back and look at the callback Leibler divergence. Remember, we've been using the callback Leibler divergence to train neural networks from uh, the third lecture, right? And the way we define the callback Leibler divergence is the sum over, if you had a two distributions, P and Q, the KL divergence was the sum over all of X of PX log of PX over QX. Now, this is not really a perfect uh, metric. Why? What can go wrong over here? What are the problems with this? Anyone? What could be an issue with this? OK. Let me ask a different question. Is this symmetric? It's not symmetric, right? Everybody agree that it's not symmetric? KLQP is not equal to KLPQ, right? OK, so that's a problem. We agree that that's a problem, right? It's not looking at the same. Uh, it's not. Uh, uh, looking at giving you the same answer regardless of which direction you look at the problem from. Are there any values, are there any situations where the derivative is going to blow up? Where this is not going to give you anything useful? Where would that be? Anyone? What would happen if Q of X was zero? What would the KL divergence be? Inf? Yeah, kind of. It's minus inf, right? So. It's going to be minus n, right? So can you compute a derivative over there? Can it, uh, once you have a minus n, do you know which way to move your parameters? No, right? So this is not really a very good measure when q becomes zero. You can say, okay, I'm going to solve this problem by looking at klqp. But then if I look at, look at klqp, does the problem go away? Has that problem, the problem of uh, unstable civil now? Because, well, log of, it goes, if, when P becomes zero, you have a problem, right? If Q of zero, Q becomes zero, it doesn't, it doesn't matter because zero log zero equals zero. But zero log infinity is infinity, right? Because this is going to grow faster. Uh, because this, this thing doesn't change. P can keep changing. So, here, if P becomes zero, you end up with a problem. Here, if Q becomes zero, you end up with a problem. So the only time when you don't have a problem is if the term that becomes zero is both inside and outside. So zero log zero is zero. It's not a problem. But anything log infinity is infinity. Zero log infinity is undefined, right? So the uh, that makes sense. You don't want the term inside to become zero or infinity, right? Firstly, 
you don't want the term, term inside to ever become uh, you have zero or infinity unless it also becomes zero outside. That makes sense? The reason is log compresses data. So zero log infinity is going to be zero. Zero log zero is also going to be zero. Zero log anything is going to be zero. So if the term inside becomes either zero or infinity, you're only okay with it if the term outside is also zero. At any other time, this is not going to be a good thing to do. That makes sense. Right? So given this, how can I fix this? We're going to we're going to use something called the Jensen-Shannon divergence. In the Jensen-Shannon divergence, instead of just using KL, I'm going to take the average of P and Q. Now the average of P and Q only becomes zero if both P and Q become zero, right? And so the Jensen-Shannon the Jensen divergence is 0.5 times the KL divergence between P and the average of P and Q plus 0.5 times the KL divergence between Q and the, and the average of P and Q, right? And so that's basically summation P log, you know, P over P plus Q, right? So the term inside the log is always going to be P plus Q. And the term inside the log can I becomes, I, you know, either zero or infinity only if both P and Q are zero. This term becomes zero only if both P and Q are zero. Do you see that? And so when I take a KL divergence of this kind, if P plus Q is zero, I know P is zero. So this term is gonna become zero. I also know that Q is zero. So this term is gonna become zero. So you get zero along zero, there are no problems. Also, it's symmetric. So the Jensen-Shannon divergence is a more stable version of and symmetric version of the KL divergence, right? So it's a symmetric variant of KL that does not exaggerate instances to which one of the distributions assigns zero probability because KL blows up, but JST does not. This makes sense? Yes or no? And so if you really look at what this guy is doing, the generator is actually trying to minimize the jensen shan This function over here is basically a scaling of the jensen shannon divergence plus an additive constant. And it's trying to minimize the jensen shannon divergence between the distribution of the generated data and the distribution of the real data. And so the optimal generator simply minimizes the Jensen-Shannon divergence between the distributions of the actual and synthetic data, it tries to make the two maximally similar, right? Uh, why do we use scale? Uh, because uh, here it sort of falls out of the way we are doing it. But then when you when you try to use uh, a JSD in other places, the derivatives become very ugly. The nice thing with KL, as we saw, is that when you took the derivative of the KL past the classification layer, it just became a simple error, right? Y minus uh, D. That won't happen for the Jensen-Shannon divergence, so it's ugly. Did I answer your question, Lawrence? We don't do it because it's ugly, that's it, right? And so here's how uh, the generator of the fully optimized scan will generate PG of X equals P of X of X because it's minimizing the JST between the uh, distributions of the true and the synthetic data. And so in this case, once the generator is perfectly matching the distribution of the true data, then at any X, the discriminator is simply going to output a 0.5 because the, the uh, generated and true distributions have identical heights, which means that if I perturb the input to the discriminator, the output does not change. The derivative of the discriminator is zero with respect to the input. This makes sense? And this only happens when the generator's output 
the, the distribution produced by the generator is exactly equal to the uh, distribution of true data. This answer. Did this make sense, guys? Yes, no. What about the rest of you? That's like five people. Okay. And so when the generator is perfectly matching, the, the, when the distribution of the generated data perfectly matches the distribution of real data, then the output of the discriminator has no derivative. The derivative is zero. And so even if you back propagate it, all derivatives going backwards are zero. And so uh, there are no more updates to be had. The training will stop. And so we have the situation that there's a stationary point for min max. If the generated data exactly matches the real data, the discriminator outputs 0.5 for all the inputs. So the, the gradients are flat and the generator stops learning. But then the problem with GANs is that if I have a perfectly random discriminator, which just outputs 0.5, regardless of the input, right? Then two, there is no deriv uh, uh, derivative going back. And so the model will not learn. So this, although in the ideal condition, it should do a very, very nice job. In non-ideal conditions, random discriminators, it's going to behave really badly. And also we have situations like stable points, stationary points need not be stable. The generator may overshoot some values or oscillate around the optimum. And uh, it's also, uh, if a discriminator has unlimited capacity, then uh, uh, it can assign arbitrarily large distributions, distances to two very similar distributions. Right. So, uh, so Hanan, yes, we will always begin by training the discriminator. And then, I mean, you won't train it to convergence because it's inefficient. You'll update the discriminator for many steps, then update the generator a little bit, then update the discriminator for many steps and update the generator a little bit. But then again, the generator and discriminator need to be trained simultaneously because if the, uh, we will be de de we'll be talking about issues with the JSD in the next class even. So it's important for both components to be trained simultaneously because if the discriminator is un under-trained, it provides suboptimal feedback to the generator. If it's over-trained, then you know, Instead of just giving you a posterior probability, it's going to give you a zero for everything to the left of the decision boundary and a one for everything to the right. So again, there are no, uh, no derivatives. So you have those issues. And so here's the overall training process. You'd initialize the generator, then you train the discriminator a little bit, then update the generator, then update this a few steps and so on, right? Now, GANs, when they first came out, the results are kind of crappy. But then they became really much better, really fast. They have stability issues. They are hard to train. Uh, and then you also have this issue of mode collapse where it can keep generating the same thing, which fools the discriminator. But when it works, it can produce really crisp results for many problems. Here's a poll, the fourth poll. It's one question. Okay, five seconds, guys. It's just a simple problem. Okay. All right. Uh, the first statement, is it true or false? Second one. Third. Fourth. So there are many situations where a GAN could fail. We'll deal with some of these in the next class. All of these are true, right? 
there have, there have been many, many, many variants and updates uh, proposed to GANs, primarily to deal with these issues, lab GAN, Wasserstein GAN, C GAN, DC GAN, and you know, based on the kinds of things you do with GANs, there have been other kinds of uh, architectures like cycle GAN, star GAN. We'll go through some of these in the next class. Uh, how do you evaluate the output? Again, uh, we think we believe it has learned a distribution, but has it really done so? Then there has been a whole bunch of work on evaluating the output of a, of a GAN. I'm not going to get into this, right? But then here's the key distinctions between VAEs and GANs. They minimize the KL divergence between the distribution of synthetic and true data. GANs as we saw them, minimize the Jensen-Shannon divergence between these distributions. VAEs use an encoder to predict latent distributions to optimize the generator. They use a discriminator to optimize the generator. VAEs, the formulation is a lot more complex, whereas the GAN formulation is very simple. But it turns out that VAEs are very simple to optimize and GANs are really hard to optimize. And then either the uh, vanilla VAE is going to give you blurry results, which is why we needed things like uh, uh, normalizing flows and diffusion models. GANs just work when they do. And again, the VAE, you know, things like normalizing flows can, uh, or diffusion models can, in fact, be the generative component of a uh, the chained uh, hierarchical uh, encoder can, in fact, be the generative component of a GAN. So uh, well, I'll, I'll just take a couple of seconds to show the progress and progression of GANs and we'll say 2019. Here was what the original GAN paper uh, showed back in 2014. GANs were able to produce very nice digits, faces. The rest were kind of not so great. But then, you know, things got better with better optimizations, better, better algorithms. And you can see by 2018, you couldn't actually distinguish between the output of a GAN and a real portrait, right? And if some of the things that you'll see in the next class show how you can use the uh, use a GAN to manipulate data, right? So yeah, some high fidelity natural images. By 2019, these things are outstanding. Pasta, this looks like pasta. I could eat it. The beautiful mushroom, not the space shuttle. Anyways, and this looks delicious. Uh, I'm going to stop right here. Thanks for waiting with me for the, you know, staying with me for the extra two minutes. And the next class, we're going to be addressing many of the shortcomings of GANs. We'll look at different types of GANs and some applications. I'll stop here and I'll take any questions. Any questions? I have a question. The equation you showed I had a one minus dA.